Joel chapter 2, when you find it, say, I got it. Amen, amen. Let's read what the Word of God says today. I'm going to read to you out of the King James Version this morning, and it says this, I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people, say it again, shall never be ashamed. Amen. I want to talk to you this morning about living shameless. Amen. Amen. Shameless this morning. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you, God, for all that you have done in our hearts and our lives already this morning and for the for the uh, wonderful presence of the Lord in this place. We pray, God, that you'll speak into our hearts through your word. Speak to those watching online today that you'll minister to them as well and right into their home. Just uh, speak to them right where they are today and minister in a very special way. And we will give you the praise and the honor for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Little is known about the prophet Joel or the biblical book that bears his name. I, I believe I read uh, this morning that there's, I think, 12 different uh, people with the name Joel in the Bible. I may have that a little off, so don't, don't uh, judge my sermon based on that. I, but I believe that's what I, I read this morning. But the only thing that we know about Joel, according to, to chapter 1, uh, verse 1, that's the only thing that's really mentioned that sets him apart. It's the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. So if you can find Pethuel, you can find Joel and find out uh, a little more detail. There's not uh, very much certainty among theologians about the timing of, of when he wrote this book and, or, or what period of time that he was talking about. But what is known is that in the book he is describing two natural disasters that uh, would occur in Israel. One was a swarm of, of all manner of locusts, and another was a drought that was going to, uh, to be there. These disasters were common throughout Israel, so again, the timing of the book, it's, it's hard to say, oh, it was during the time of the great drought and locust infestation because that was uh, somewhat common in those days. And, and so we, we don't really know the timing of when it was written, but we know the message of it is a very timeless message, just like all the Word of God. There's centuries ago and, and generations and generations ago that these words were written, but they were written inspired by the Holy Ghost and they are still a timeless word for you and me to live by today. If we would just uh, stay, uh, if this nation would get back to living by the word of God and, and walking uh, people would walk according to the word of God, we would find the timeless blessings that came on those of old can also come in our day and time. And this message that Joel is giving here is a threefold message in this, in this book. He calls people uh, in the nation uh, together to come for a time of heartfelt prayer, to say it's time that we seek the Lord. It's time that we begin to look and, and call out on the name of the Lord. And when we do that, he's calling people then to repent and return to God. Don't just pray, but repent of the, the sins. Don't just lament over them. Do that, but also repent over them. It's one thing to be sorry about what has gone on, but it's another thing to confess it and repent of it before the Lord. And, and so, so he's calling people to prayer. He's calling them to repent and return to God. And then finally, he's delivering a message from God that's a prophetic message of encouragement that is simply saying that when they repent, that blessing is going to come to them. Now, there's a, a wonderful thought to know that if we remain faithful to serving God, that God will fulfill his promise 
blessings to us. Amen. You say, well, life is hard and it's difficult to live a Christian life in an ungodly world. I totally agree with you at times. There, there is a difficulty in, in remaining, uh, uh, putting our trust in God when we look around and, and see what's going on around us and it's overwhelming. But I want to encourage you. God is a person. Uh, he is one that will never for, uh, uh, forget his promises. He will fulfill his promises to his people. So I want to talk to you today about this encouragement that God has given. Surely, sure, there's things going on in their day, but he says that there's blessing that's coming your way. And, and the, the product of this uh, promise that he repeats in verse 26 and verse 27 is that my people shall never be ashamed. You can walk through this life and you can come out unscathed uh, because you uh, as far as with shame because I will take away your shame. I will take away your grief. I will take away your hurt. And uh, he promises even so far to say, I will wipe every tear from your eyes. That's promised in the book of Revelation. And that is something that we are all anticipating if we are living for the Lord. And I want you to see this, that we can be a part of the people of God that shall never be ashamed. Everybody that's listening to me today, whether you're in this building or you're watching online, every one of us has some regrets in our life, and these regrets are accompanied by a level of shame to some, to some level. And no doubt there are those memories uh, that we think of that are shameful, of, of shameful living. There's times when we did things that we are ashamed of today. There's, there's even uh, uh, not just uh, lifetime, uh, life experiences as far as uh, lifestyles, but there's also been times when we have made uh, individual choices that have uh, caused us to have shame in our hearts. Maybe it's a, a one-time thing or a one-time event, but I just want to encourage you today, God is still bigger than all of our past, amen, all of our mistakes, all of our sins, all of our rebellion, everything that we have tried to uh, uh, to do in our, on our own that has built up this wall between us and God, God is still greater than whatever walls that we may have built around us, amen, anybody know what I'm talking about, he is able to turn turn our hearts around and uh, cause the shame to be taken away and to re be removed from us. It, it makes no difference uh, uh, if it was a, a lifestyle or just an individual thing. God is still able to remove the anguish and the shame and, and all of that that seems so powerful today, but God can set us free. If you remember the book of, uh, uh, in, the, in the Gospels and in the book of Acts, uh, we see the, 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 the victory of that. But in the Gospels, we see where there was a, a man by the name of Peter that after he committed to following Christ all the way to death, I'll never leave you, Lord. I will walk with you all the way. I will be right by your side. There's nothing that can change me. And we brought this out uh, on uh, Wednesday night uh, last week, I believe, when, when a little teenage girl came up to to. Peter and said, you're one of them. And he says, I don't know what you're talking about. He, he even began to curse at the girl and say, say, you have lost your mind, little, and you don't know what you're talking about. But God uh, had a way of reaching out to Peter because suddenly there was a rooster that crowed. And when that rooster crowed, Peter recognized right away that he had done the Lord's shame and harm. And, and he began to get heavy in his heart. And he began to uh, uh, see that, that, that weight of sin was upon him and it brought shame to him. How about King David? King David was another man who gave in to temptation. He should have been out fighting the battle but instead he was uh, out on his rooftop uh, watching a, a young lady uh, bathing and, and he uh, decided to call that woman and he spent a night with that woman uh, who was his best friend's uh, or excuse me, a friend of his. It was her, his wife and we know the story after she became uh, 
expect, an expecting mother, suddenly David took the authority and the power that he had and he put the, the husband out in the, in the front line so that he would die, so that uh, uh, the shame would be taken away. But I'll tell you what, no amount of sin that we do can cover up the shame that we feel. That's why we've got to turn it over to the Lord. When the prophet came to David and said, Thou art the man, David said, Yes, I am. And, and God forgave him and God turned the situation around. The actions of both Peter and King David resulted in a flood of shame that threatened to overtake them and, and threatened the rest of their lives. But yet we see that there is something wonderful that happened that maybe uh, even though they faced some consequences from their, their past and, and what they, the decisions they made, they were given the opportunity to repent and both of them repented and received the Lord's forgiveness. Afterwards, David went on to be a powerful king and now he's known as someone who is a man after God's own heart. Peter was one who repented and just a short time after that, God anointed him with the Holy Ghost and he stepped out on a, on a platform on a ledge of a porch and began to preach to a, a mass congregation there in Jerusalem and 5,000 souls gave their heart to Jesus. They should have been wallowing in their shame, but God brought them out and done miraculous things through them. So I'm just trying to tell you, that is not just for a bygone day. That is the God that we serve who is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. If He brought them out of their shame and used them, He can bring you out and use you. Amen. And even more than He can do that, He desires to do that. He will do that if you will trust Him and you will allow Him to do so. The nation of Israel was dealing with a similar matter of shame as they had grown further and further away from the Lord and they were living lives that were in opposition to the plans of God. Justice required that judgment would fall on that nation of Israel because of their sins, but God being true to his promise that he made in Isaiah 57 verse 15, some 115 years prior to that, he spoke through the prophet Isaiah and said, I will not stay angry with you forever. I will not hold a grudge. Amen. Aren't you thankful he doesn't hold a grudge? Amen. I will not uh, keep this against you, but my mercy will continue on from generation to generation to generation. The psalmist said, said his love endures forever. Amen. Hallelujah. After a judgment of locusts had fallen upon their crops, God now is promising Israel that he would restore everything the locusts had destroyed. If they would heed to his word and repent and commit their lives to serving him, he would restore blessing to them. Dr. Jack Hayford stated it like this concerning that what Joel was to ravage Judah, the church is to a ravaged world, namely a prophetic voice bringing God's viewpoint into clear focus calling for repentance and extending the hope of salvation from the final and terrible day of the Lord. Amen. Just as Joel was used as a voice to speak to the nation of Israel, we as the church need to speak to our generation. Amen. We do not need to get blinded by all of the, the, the information that's flowing across the airways and get discouraged and get depressed and get overwhelmed and get saddened by the news that we see around us. We are a voice like John the Baptist of one crying in the wilderness. We are lifting up and preparing the way of the Lord. He was preparing the way of the Lord's first return. You and I need to prepare the way of the Lord that he is coming back and when he comes, he's going to come to, to redeem us unto himself. Hallelujah. Oh, that's good stuff right there. The beauty of the new covenant is if we turn from our lives that are devoted to sin and devote our lives to the wonderful good news of the gospel of Christ, then we experience salvation for ourselves and then we become the voices that bring salvation to others that will listen and share this gospel. The purpose that I want to talk to you, you this morning on this message is to get us beyond the shame of what used to be and deliver us from being ashamed of the gospel that has made us free to serve God. I don't know how you are, but there has been times in my life when the majority of my prayer time was just simply shame. 
just simply pointing out to God, you just trying to remind God, you remember how bad I was. Come on, somebody. God says, I want to forget, uh, forgive you and, and uh, put your sins as far as the east is from the west, and you just keep trying to remind me of them. I don't know how many times we do that. We are so caught up in and bound in shame and the Lord says, I want you to never, ever, ever be ashamed again. That, that was then, I've made you brand new. That was something back then, that's not who you are. That's who you was, but that's not who you are. Amen. You and I have to understand when we, when we have become the bride of Christ as the church, our name is changing from where we were to who he uh, has made us to be. Amen. I'm no longer that person I used to be. Can anybody testify to that? I'm not the same. Amen. I'm not the same. Amen. So let's just quickly look at this. Uh, Joel uh, chapter 2 verse 26 says this. this. This one part here, he says, and he, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed. This is a very simple outline for you that's taking notes. God does wonders for his people. He does wonders. That's point one. God does wonders. God used the prophet Joel to assure his people, those in that day and also in this day, that God is the God who performs the miracles for his children. In verse 20, he says he'll drive away their enemies. In verse 22, he says he will cause them to be fruitful. In verse 23, he promised to demonstrate his faithfulness to them through refreshing rains, of the, the spring and the autumn rains, amen. In verses 24 and 25, he promises he will provide healing and restoration for all that has been lost or damaged. In verse 26, he promises that he'll provide for all of their needs when he says, you will eat in plenty. In other words, there will be nothing lacking for you. When this message that God speaks to us and uh, it delivers that, that thought of God's power to do wonders among us, there's at least uh, two reasons behind it. One is a, is a reminder and the other one is an assurance. There's a wonderful thought to uh, be a reminder to us of what God has done in the past. Now, I'm not a legal expert by no means, but I do know enough to know that when a, a judgment is passed, the, the, the powers that be will look back back over history and, and uh, uh, previous cases and see if there was a precedent that was laid out before. And if that precedent was there, then they can build a case or, 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 or base a judgment uh, based on that precedent. And, and that will uh, help solidify the, the thought that it's not something just one, one individual is coming up with. That is a consorted effort from some time in the past. What that tells me in the Word of God is if God has said Set a precedent that by his stripes they were healed in those days. By his stripes he, we are healed today. If he set a precedent that demons were cast out of individuals in those days, then he has a, a precedent in place that demons will be cast out in our day. If he has set a precedent that he will provide for uh, his people miraculously in those days, he can provide for us in these days. I'm just trying to say, if you can look in the word of God and see, a precedent of what God has acted and done wondrously in the past don't think for a moment that he's not still well able to do wondrously in our lives today amen and so it's a reminder just to remind us of what he has done but it's an assurance to tell us that if he did it then he can do it now amen they could remember back to God bringing their forefathers through the wilderness and through uh, from the Egyptian bondage and putting them on the path to the promised land. And if he did uh, those powerful miracles in those days, then he could still do wonders for them 
in their day, just like us. We know that the Word of God is full of reminders of God's wonder-working power that was passed uh, uh, in previous generations, but we also know that there are some times when He has moved in our lives, and we have some wonderful memories of, of when God brought us out and he, how He provided in the midst of a situation and how He did a work that, that we didn't know uh, was possible, and He came along and performed a miracle. Some of you hearing this message, know that if it wasn't for the power of God to work wonders in your shameful past, you wouldn't be here today, but you know that he has, and you know that he is able to deliver your children and your grandchildren and your, and your great-grandchildren. You know that if he did a wonderful work in you, you are not something special that, that he cannot uh, do it also in someone else's life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So having already experienced God's wonders in our past, why would we think for a moment that he's not presently able to deliver us in this day, in this hour? So because of God's power to work wonders in our lives, we also know that his promise to remove our shame is still intact. So he says, I, no, no, remember what he said there? He says, I have dealt wondrous with, wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. Since I did a wonderful work in your life, you don't have to be ashamed. You don't have to fear. You don't have to worry. Second thing we see is, is there as we pick up in verse 26, and my people shall never be ashamed. Verse 27 says, and you shall know that I am in the midst of thee. God has done wondrously. And God dwells within. Amen. He did wonderful things for his people. He dwells within his people. Therefore, I shall not be ashamed. God's desire has always been to dwell with his people. In the Old Testament, we witness examples of God spending time with Adam and Eve in the cool of the, garden of, uh, in the, cool of the day in the, in the Garden of Eden. We witness Enoch was a man who walked with God. Noah was a man who uh, brought his family together in an ark of safety to, to spend time with God while the rest of the world was perishing. Abraham is testified about his life that he was a friend of God. Amen. He loves, God loves to be with people. He loves to be with his creation. He wants to dwell with them. Then after the pattern for the tabernacle worship was established, then God's Shekinah glory came down and dwelt in the midst of them. That Shekinah glory, another definition of that is the manifest presence of God. His presence came down in a cloud of smoke into that building so strong and so powerful that not even the priest could stand to minister because of the presence and the dwelling of the Lord. Amen. Moses when he cried out to God, would you show me your glory? God says, I will bring you to a place, but I will cover you in that place so you can, you can uh, still live to tell about it. My presence is so strong that it will destroy you, but I want you to know today that God still wants to pour out his presence in this day and hour. Uh, can I just tell you the time for his presence being poured out, it, again, is not for some past day. We need his presence poured out in our day. We need his presence poured out in this building, in this, these homes, in these lives because without his presence we can't make it. Amen. God wants to dwell within his people. We're walking in shame and fear and everything you can think about because of what we're seeing in the news. People have spent hour upon hour upon hour in front of television, in front of computer screens, in pr front of uh, printed uh, articles, reading things and, to, and just seeing how awful the world is and how much the world is acting like the world when God is just crying out to say, would you just dwell with me? Come into my presence. I've extended Extended my presence to you. And if we will be as the church and come into his presence, then we don't have to walk in shame and fear any longer. Hallelujah. Woo. He's, he poured out his glory and he can do it again in our day. In the new covenant we're living in, we, we also witness the indwelling presence of God among his people. We first of all saw it in John 1 verse 14 when Christ was made the word that was made flesh and dwelt among us. 
Then in Acts chapter 2, we see the Holy Ghost being poured out and dwelling amongst His people, in the midst of His people. And Jesus said that, that we could experience that uh, special love and grace in His, pres- in, in his presence. We, we can walk in the Spirit and the power of God. So our shame is forever taken away through God's power to do wonders, through His power to dwell within, And then finally, through his power to declare the word. There's a powerful word that you hold in your hand. Amen. Demons tremble when you declare this. Amen. Sickness and disease has to cower down at this because his word was sent to heal us. Amen. Verse 27, the Lord says, I am the Lord your God. And none else and my people shall never be ashamed. He declared his word over them. And he says, I am the, word, I am the Lord your God. There's, there's a powerful thing in a promise. There's a phrase we sometimes use that is intended to solidify a promise that we're making when we say, you have my word. I, I'm telling you this. I, you have my word. I am going to do what I told you I'm going to do. God makes promises, and he backs his promises up. They're not wasted words. When we use the phrase that you have my word, we are trying to assure the listener that I'm going to do what I said. The problem with this is a study that was conducted in 2002. They said by age four, 90% of children have already grasped the concept of lying. Any witnesses here to that? You don't have to go there. Did you take those cookies? No, it wasn't me. (laughs) 90% of children have grasped the concept of lying. And 60% of adults can't have a 10-minute conversation without lying at least once. And in that 10-minute conversation, it said actually the people who were studied told an average of three lies during that 10-minute conversation. According to another study, people lie to their parents 86% of the time, to their friends 75% of the time, to their siblings 73% of the time, and to their spouses 69% of the time. So I thought, that can't be true. Can't be true. I don't know. That seems awful high. But I, then I started thinking, how many times, you know that favorite story that you tell? How many has got a favorite story you tell? of an experience that happened to you. And how many times does that experience get better and better and better every time it's told? (laughs) We just keep, you know, you talk about fishermen, you know, how big was that fish? You know, I don't know. It grows every time. But it's always a story to help us look better for our audience. So maybe there's some truth in that. Maybe we don't just lie, but we just exaggerate. But I'll never forget what an old timer told me years and years ago. He said, you know what the difference, or you know what the definition of exaggeration is? I said, no, what? He said, an exaggeration is a thin layer of skin wrapped over a bold-faced lie. So I don't know about you, but according to this, if half of this is true, there's too much lying going on. I I heard a sermon talk uh, one time about uh, 21 times in a day, I believe it was, the average person lies. Uh, You know, a little leaven leaveneth the whole bunch according to Scripture. But I'm just trying to say, even in the little things, if we are not uh, completely true, why do we expect people to believe us? And and, and so we we enter into a relationship with the Lord automatically with some distrust because we know people. And we know us. Amen. But God is not a man that he should lie, Scripture says. He always keeps his promises. He's always telling the truth. Based on these stats that we just talked about, it's such an encouragement to know that if God said it, he will perform it. Amen. If God declared it, it's going to happen. He's not like other men. Amen. He's not like individuals. Uh, Amen. He does not lie. So what God was declaring to the Israelites in Joel chapter 2, that I am the Lord your God, 
one. You have my word. He says, I will take away your shame. You have my word. Amen. He says, I will heal your body. You have my word. Amen. He says, I will provide for your every need. You have my word. Amen. I'm trying to encourage you this morning that this word that you hold in his hand is a book of promises that he intends to fulfill. Hallelujah. You can walk in joy. You can walk in strength. You can walk in the victory of the Lord. Well, what if this happens? You, can, you still have something you can lean on and get your, get your uh, way through it because the Word of God is going to be fulfilled. One reason for shame that we experience can be a result of a lie that we've lived or even are currently living. But I want to encourage you this morning that God is here to take away every single ounce of your shame. You have his word. His word is good news. It's the gospel. And notice Paul said in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek So when he promised Joel to tell the people, I will take away all of your shame. I'll take every bit of it away. I'll take away what what shame you've been carrying around. It's a promise that he's going to pull that shame away that was based on Joel 2.17 that said, let the priest who minister in the Lord's presence stand and weep between the entry room to the, altar, to the temple and the altar. Let them pray, spare your people, Lord. Let, don't let your sp- special possession become an object of mockery. Don't let them become a joke for unbelieving foreigners who say, has the God of Israel left them? If you want your shame to be taken away, it begins with prayer. It begins just simply with coming before the Lord and coming clean before Him and saying, God, this is me. This is me. If you walked into this service carrying shame, you can walk out of it, this service with no shame. You can walk out of this service without fear, laying it all down before the Lord and saying, God, I give you my heart. I give you my life. Amen. Would you stand with me in this room? And if I'm talking to you,